Hello and welcome to the Buckets and Tea MBA show. I'm your host, Catherine Niker. Thanks so much for tuning into this week's episode. Today, joining me, you know him, you love him. He's the, you know, Raptors Don't do Republic this again. Don't do guy. <laughs> He's your guy. He's the coach as he is now branding himself. It's Samson Folk. Can I tell you you something? I think that like you introduce me as if I were a bashful like four year old, you know, like it's like, you know, him, you love it's your guy. It's your little guy. And I'm like walking out like, "Mm, well, I didn't do the voice like the kid voice. You know what I mean? I wasn't like, I don't think you do that anyway. You love him. I think that you are somebody who read a book that was like, kids will learn language better if you speak to them without adjusting like either your decibels. So you're like, hello, child. <laughs> Pleasure to meet you. <laughs> I'm encouraging your vocal and language skills right now. Actually, true? you know what? Uh, I when uh, So my brother had a kid just last April. So my nephew's like 11 months old now. And Congrats. Thank you. And uh, I I was like that. To, I told that to my brother that I wasn't going to raise my voice or have a cutesy voice. And I was like, you're never going to hear my cutesy voice and blah, blah, blah. Because I don't know. I guess my brother and I just have that kind of relationship. And then, of course, when I see my nephew, I'm like, hey, you know what I mean? And it just came yeah. and it came out. And then in the summer, like he had these like cute little like baby sunglasses. And I was freaking out over how cute these baby sunglasses were and then my brother was like aha i caught you and i was like yeah all right (laughs) but you did initially think that that you were going to like talk to him like hello yeah it was something like i was like you're not gonna catch me being adorable and cute Mm. wait was this more for was this more for the baby or for yourself like you thought it was like emasculating or something you're like i won't do that yeah emasculating you couldn't catch me out (laughs) No, no, no. I think it was just, I, I don't know. I like to have a bit of a a, 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 a tough side. Yeah, you could say that. Oh, okay. You know, like I'm not going to be cute and whatever. And then I, and then I was, and then I melted, you know? A relationship fascist. A fascist? Yeah, like you're like, okay, we don't have to go down this. No, road. do it. This is what people really want to hear. They don't care about my basketball these, opinions. <laughs> these, are, these are the conversations I have with Lewis about, you know, fatherhood or or perhaps doggerhood when you're like, you know, you have a dog and he, he always characterizes himself as a drill sergeant. And but I, I perceive I've been around Lewis and his child. I think he well, now his two children. I think he's mm. um, a fantastic father. What a great little family. But he he's described himself with uh, um, very uh, severe terms before. And the, the outcome was good. So maybe fascist in the terms of interpersonal relationships can sometimes be a good guiding force. Mm. Wow. <laughs> Depending if you have the right idea for what things should be going forward. You know what? This we're going to. We're listen, we're gonna do a mailbag pod. Everyone send us your relationship based questions. <laughs> yeah. Do you know a relationship fascist? Is Do you like know a, a relationship fas- fascist? Do you think I'm one? Um, mm-hmm. let us know. Uh and we'll go from I'll bring that up with my uh, therapist uh, maybe next week if there's if there's time. Sure. If there's time, you know. Uh, all right, we got to move on. We got to talk basketball here. Uh, NBA first, then Raptors stuff per usual. Um, I want to talk about Rudy Gobert, not because I think he's a relationship fascist, but uh, earlier this week, um, he was fined a hundred thousand dollars for essentially uh, criticizing the refs. Uh, he made a gesture, like a money gesture, t- to them, and essentially insinuated that the refs had some sort of hand in gambling. Um, this was the largest fine, I believe, for this very specific thing to date. Um, you know, obviously the league cares about its, you know, officiating integrity, et cetera. Uh, what did you think of this? As with anything, you cannot prove a negative, i.e. the burden of proof Mm. is on the accuser. I think that is a healthy structure to build from in terms of like a societal ethic, right? So having Rudy Gobert just come out and say, like, 
the NBA is rigged for the Kings, I think is a negative, especially since he's doing it just based off of like, oh, fuck this game. This was bullshit. <laughs> you know, like he's just mm-hmm, kind of being mm-hmm. like that type of guy. Mm-hmm. And also, if we look at where there was corruption with the league officials, it most historically went against the Kings. <laughs> the Lakers, Absolutely. The Lakers and Kings. So Absolutely. I I think you could you could try and build a compelling case, not one you'd win anywhere, but you could try and build a compelling case that would, I don't know, uh, pick up on the YouTube algorithm as people kind of like tuned into it, perhaps, where you say like, oh, these big teams get this type of whistle. I know there was conversation about that after Raptors versus Lakers we saw. Mm. Would it surprise me if there was like the most thorough investigation of all time and they found there was a cognitive bias towards certain teams no do i think like there's an overhead expectation or directive drop down to refs to manage games towards certain like over under outcomes or certain wins versus losses i do doubt that now are there mistakes can you feel particularly persecuted when mistakes run towards your end of things yeah I think Rudy Gobert was probably just like emotional and was like, oh, the NBA is mm. totally rigged for the Kings. I do think that's probably what it was. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, like you said, I mean, bringing up the Kings is a great point. Like maybe if it were the Lakers or something like that, then it might have. If more... only they then didn't might... need Sacramento. You know? <laughs> then maybe it would hold a yeah. little more weight. Um, I agree. Or like, you know, if someone like a dream on green was flippant and they kept and they were being soft again or something, but I, you know, but yeah, I mean, I think there, I think there is a real risk for corruption because of how legalized and how much money there is in gambling. So uh, I haven't really heard the league talk about like what measures are in place beyond well, their little like new measure where players can now invest in gambling companies which is great glad they ironed that out in the cba right oh i did not know that oh, really yeah well, it was because players was that like, in the summer yeah because players were like we need to be able to get a piece of the pie and then everybody was like that's true you do need a piece of the pie now it's probably my contention that like that pie need not be eaten so in such a gluttonous fashion <laughs> but we are excel. We are accelerating towards something in society here. I'll, I'll leave that there, though. Yeah. They also have very large pieces of pie as it is. Well, it's more so in like the, not in that they're millionaires, but that it's like labor versus ownership. I think is kind of the contention there, which I agree from, from like a, that lens. I guess you have the right to earn based on anything, but then once you get into the weeds of like. Should a player be able to own or invest in a gambling company that runs odds on the sport with which they partake? Seems to me like that's a conflict of interest. Something like that, yeah. Uh, I agree because there's so many other businesses in the world that are lucrative that they could invest in if they wanted. That That's it's kind not of the thing, right? It's not like it's this or nothing. You know what I mean? You know what? <laughs> they they often propose it that way, right? It's like if you don't let me do this, I will scream. And that's like I'm not saying that's NBA players. That's just like people who invest in general. And typically, you know, the American economy kind of leans towards that. Well, we don't want you to scream, and you should be able to do whatever you want. So. I guess that's where we are. Wow. I mean, look, I think in this particular circumstance, you know, like Rudy Gobert was just being emotional and like heat of the moment yeah. kind of thing. But the idea that that could be real is go ahead. You have your hand up. Wait, go, go. Wait, you finished no, that thought. No, I'm so I, sorry. You, no, no, no. Go ahead. What is the most amount of money being emotional has ever cost you? <laughs> cost me? Yeah. Uh oh, I actually have a recent example. Well, I don't know if it's me being emotional. 
Okay, oh, well, I'll share this. So, so you know, I'm a huge Janet Jackson fan. Yes. We've talked about Janet Jackson on like three of these podcasts. Okay. Well, anyway, so she's, so she last year had a meet and greet and I spent a lot of money to do that. Yes. And I was like, I'm going to do this, you know, once in my life, this is huge. Had a great time. And then she announced she's coming back again. And I was like, oh, okay. Like I do want to <laughs> see her, but this is a lot of money. Right. And so I have friends who I've met through being a Janet Jackson fan. Okay. It You're part of a Janet Jackson fan club? Uh no, we're just our own group. Mm, okay. And and we're friends outside of just being Janet fans, but that's how we sure. met. Right. Um, and then the tickets go on sale and they're eleven hundred dollars more than I spent a year ago. And I was like, and I asked my friend to get them for us because we're going together. And then she's like on Ticketmaster and I'm on the phone and it's like right when the tickets went on sale and like, you know, it's all hype. And I'm like debating it. And then I was like, wait, no, I can't do this. And then she said, it's too late. I bought them. Mm. And now I feel like I'm in debt and I'm trying <laughs> to sell this single ticket. but. That's Look, I, this is the wrong podcast for this. I am desperate to find an eccentric <laughs> gay man who will buy this ticket for me because no one else will. And it's in it's listen, it's over three thousand dollars. <laughs> so this is like me being an insane fan of something and and it's cost me money and I don't want to go. I want to see the concert, but I don't want to do this meet and greet again. I met her once. It was perfect. Oh, man. It was perfect. And I, I can't recapture that moment. Ooh. And I know that. And I tried to say no. And then she bought it anyways. And, and it's just stupid. Well, I think so stupid. That is a lot of money. It's so much money. And for people listening, like, wow, that's crazy. I know that's crazy. That's why I tried to, to say, say no. no. Yeah. But well, they, but they're so crazy that they're like, yeah, like they'll spend anything to see her. Like they'll just, they don't think about it. And Rudy Gobert will spend anything to get his message <laughs> out there. Well, are you going to answer the same question? What's the most? I'm very good at not wasting money. Stop. No, no, seriously, I'm very good at not wasting Stop. money. I had this is an ethic growing up that like my parents didn't spend like on anything that wasn't necessary. I even told this story when I was on Sportsnet was that to raise money for like my travel basketball to go to the States and all that kind of stuff. We picked ditches like clean of garbage to get money from the government of Saskatchewan instead of like paying <laughs> for something like that. So what is the most money? I like, I don't know. I really couldn't tell you. I asked the question expecting you to have something. And I was so <laughs> honestly that says in, a lot about me. I was so enraptured by this story of thousands of dollars being spent on a whim and then now using, you know, the captive audience of the podcast to try and locate something. <laughs> for, for what it's worth, my parents raised me better, also. Okay. Mm. <laughs> like, <laughs> They did not raise but me. You were, you, were by, you were corrupted by your I was corrupted by my friend. Yeah, I was corrupted yeah. by my friend. Yeah. So <laughs> so I don't actually have a good story, which I have to apologize for, but I was really enraptured by your telling of it. Which Listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna confident. ask you again at the end of the episode, and then we'll see if you've thought of something. Okay. All right. That's Ooh, okay. actually, oh, there we go. It wasn't emotional. A friend of mine said he really wanted the Spider-Man game, the new Spider-Man game. And this really made me feel like a dumbass because he kept talking about how much he wanted it. And then so I sent him, he lives in America. I sent him the money for it on PayPal. And there's a fee on PayPal. Of yes. Course. I sent him the money and come to check my phone later. He had sent it back and said like, no, I'm not. No, I don't want that. And I said, okay. And I realized we had just donated $14 to Jeff Bezos. This is terrible. We just like used it to transfer money back and forth. So it's not emotional. I just felt like a dumbass. You know, I was like, I can't believe I gave this. I didn't even know he, he owned PayPal. Oh, wait. Jeff Bezos owns Amazon. Amazon, which bought PayPal. I oh, 
or if, God, I don't know. Anyway, fourteen dollars. Fourteen dollars. I've definitely spent. He he probably something stupider than that, but I can't think of it right now. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sure the the audience was riveted by uh, by that <laughs> response. Yeah, you're dealing with thousands. I'm like. The fourteen dollars. I just never. And, and sadly, a recent example. I am still trying to sell this ticket. <laughs> if you know anybody, if you know a friend of a friend, I might even sell it at a loss, just to sell it. So please, please, For anybody. I, I yeah. If there's any like ardent investors out there who think that they could buy it at a loss and turn it again, yeah, buy it from Catherine. Yeah. Anyway, that's because ticket. Ma I've never had to resell a ticket before. Ticketmaster takes so much. What do they take? Uh, it's like they 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 feed. Sorry, I don't know how to explain this. There's two separate fees, mm -hmm. and because this ticket is so expensive, it ends up being like hundreds of dollars extra. So you have to sell it for so much more just to make the money back. So that's so me, I'm like, I'll sell it at a bit of a loss because then it's like if I'm selling it directly, then I'm not just like handing over all this extra money to Ticketmaster. That's basically what I'm saying. That's tough. Oh, Basket, okay, let's move on. <laughs> okay, so um, this is a bit of a a topic that I've seen discussed throughout the season. And that is, you know, the face of the NBA and mm -hmm. that the last five MVP winners have been uh, essentially not American and people, American media yeah. have talked about, you know, can the face of the NBA be a non-American player? Um, Dario Sarch did an interview this week that I thought was interesting when he talked about how the league could probably be more European than it currently is, but he feels like the league would likely put a stop to it mm -hmm. uh, and that they wouldn't necessarily allow that to happen, which I thought was uh, an interesting perspective because it's not something I've heard before. Um, and he, uh, someone being in the league who feels that way is to me somewhat telling, but for me, like as a Canadian, I could give a shit. Like, yeah. I don't care if the quote unquote face of the league is American or Canadian or wherever they're from. Like, I just want them to be a very good basketball player and a stand up guy. Like, that's what I care about. So it's like when I hear all this American media talk about how the face of the league has to be American so they can market it to Americans. I'm just like, what is this disconnect? So I think probably it falls directly under like American exceptionalism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like it's just that um, xenophobia is obviously baked into that. What I thought was interesting mm. is like, and I could, I could not have the proper amount of scope for this. So forgive me. And I won't have any strong opinions about it for that reason. But it is funny that like xenophobia has 100% been like a, typically white guy in america thing like those are the strongest xenophobes out there but actually like the most po the most popular opinions of people championing kind of like anti-african or anti-european sentiment in the nba has been like black men former black players kind of dissenting upon like the europeans or the african players coming over which is like an odd turn on its head to mm -hmm. see those people representing like the xenophobic views um, of course, that's just what I've seen. I'm not suggesting that black people have become more xenophobic than white people. <laughs> of course, that is not my suggestion. I just do think it's like, oh, I'm gonna get uh, Daniel, our intern, to uh, clip oh, that. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I'm that is that is a small scope of what I've seen, and of course, is relative to the what the algorithm or like what Twitter is feeding me. So me seeing like. Gilbert Arenas and people of that ilk championing these ideas is where that perspective mm. is coming from and being like, hmm, you know, xenophobia is, you know, very pervasive, obviously. Do I care? No, I like, and I, this is also when people talk about like, oh, we need the NBA to like do better head to head against NFL games, or we need the NBA to like grow. 
why? I, why? Who cares? Mm-hmm. You're like, you're a fan. Now for, I guess, myself, is it beneficial for the league to grow and for more eyes at clicks or whatever, I guess. But to watch a sport and think about it from like the profit motive or like, you know, growth incentive. What is that fun? Like, are you sitting around being like this league needs an American face on it? Why? <laughs> Who cares? Like, don't you enjoy watching like Jokic play or Embiid play or Giannis play that like the international MVPs who have come over? Do you not enjoy that? Uh-huh. Would you be getting your rocks off if like Giannis was named like James, like Donahue? And you're like, this guy's American. That's such a good uh, Milwaukee name. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it feels but, very right? Milwaukee. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just like, why does that stuff matter? You know, like the MLB is the MLB like, oh no, Shohei. Oh, gross. Not yeah. American. No, they're like, oh my God, the international game. It's so beautiful. We love it. We kneel before it. I don't know. Just like mm-hmm. the players are there. Market the players you have. You're marketing. Market them. Market Scotty Barnes as like the big American player. He is going to be one of them for the foreseeable future. Do so like that. Appeal to those people who want to see the waving flag behind him. Take a video of him with his hand over his chest. I don't care, really. But like to think that this league will suffer if we don't have like an American person as Leo Messi came over from Argentina, played in Spain, played in France, and completely shook up American soccer. I just, it's so unimaginative. It's so clearly sitting just in xenophobia. And it's just like, why doesn't the guy look like me and talk like me and like the things I like? And it's like, is that what you need to enjoy the basketball? Please grow up type thing. <laughs> Yeah, I completely agree. I love how you started this by saying you weren't going to have strong opinions. But... I only have strong opinions on like <laughs> only have strong opinions on where I've seen it parroted and like the interesting perspective from that. But as far as like the thing overall, I'm like, is this a baby brain? Like it feels baby brain. He's mm-hmm, like, mm-hmm. why doesn't why isn't the guy from where I'm from? Like you, I didn't have any problem watching the NBA between. Steve Nash and Shea Gillis Alexander. Mm-hmm. I wasn't like, why isn't there a Canadian MVP? Now with Shea like hot on the heels in the race and looking like he could win it, you're like, yeah, that's really cool that that's happening. But you don't you don't necessarily like yearn for it and say, if this doesn't happen, my fandom may dwindle, and I wonder what happens to the sport. Mm-hmm. It's like I don't know. Basketball is really good. You just like cheer for the guys. I don't. I, I don't know why people need like the idolatry along with the enjoyment, perhaps. Yeah, look, I completely agree with you. The whole thing doesn't really make any logical sense to me. I mean, I feel like, it, sorry, you said a lot, so I'm kind of digesting it. But <laughs> no, but in a good way, in a good way, for sure. I, I mean, yeah, you're absolutely right. The whole thing doesn't make any sense. I mean, like you said, even from a marketing perspective, like there are so many like very charming and likable things with someone like Jokic or someone like Giannis. Like there's so many things to like about those players. If you're trying to, you know, branch out and showcase their personalities and stuff. And then the other thing I feel is like, you know, we started off the two thousands. I feel really talking about international expansion with the NBA, right? I mean, obviously, you know, we have the Raptors and, you know, the Vancouver Grizzlies and stuff like that, but there was always talk about like, how do we get the league to grow internationally, right? Like, how do we get an audience in Europe? How do we get an audience in China? How do we get a larger audience in Australia? Like that was the talk for a really long time. And so, and, and still is to some degree. So then to turn around and be like, oh, the face of the league still has to be American really counterproductive and really like it kind of goes against the natural capitalist nature of wanting to grow the league in general anyways um so it just doesn't make sense to me on so many levels but i just feel like that conversation is growing and growing and you were a good person to to have that conversation with i'll also say the dario sarge thing 
I would lean again on like the burden of proof. It's a pretty big accusation to suggest that like the NBA is dissenting upon like European people having more of a an impact on the league. Just like at the start, him being like, "Oh no, no, they won't allow that to happen." It's like I feel like they would like well, it, the, it, go ahead. No, in fairness to him, it was phrased more like an opinion mm. than a fact. Sure. Yeah, I would just to your to point about like the capital the capitalist nature of it. I think the NBA will allow whatever type of play that creates the most money to happen. Right. And if it's European players, African players, East Asian players, whatever, like Southeast Asian, whatever it ends up being, they'd be like, yes, give, give, support, support, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Yeah, like I don't think we're going to be in a world where suddenly like no one American is in the league. Like, you know what I mean? Like they'll they'll be fine. Yeah, people, yeah, people are doing great replacement theory for the NBA. Good luck. <laughs> we must secure the future of our American born players. Yeah, you know, whatever. <laughs> Um, you know, you, you mentioned uh, Gilbert Arenas earlier. One thing I wanted to talk to you about. This is just kind of a fun topic that I feel like I wanted your opinion on. And I think a lot of the Raptors Republic listeners would love your opinion on is player podcasts. So yeah. we've seen a massive boom, especially over the last year, but it's been happening for the last several years uh, in player podcasts. And I feel like a lot of people have varying opinions on player podcasts, despite the fact that most of them are doing quite well. Um, you know, I feel like there's some people who are, I, I would call it like, it it's almost like a personal propaganda machine mm -hmm. where it's like, not how most people see the truth, but it's them just sort of pushing their brand. And then there's other people that are maybe a bit more objective. Um, as a famous podcaster yourself, and yes, I phrased it that way without sounding, making you sound like a four-year-old. <laughs> how do you feel about player podcast, Samson? I really like, now I don't listen to any of them actively. My consumption of these things is through clips. I think that Jeff Teague is one of the most gifted storytellers I've ever heard as far as like being uh, funny. I think that he's extremely humble and capable of telling a story from somehow like a bench player's perspective, even though he made an all-star game. He makes himself sound like he didn't deserve to be on an NBA floor and he was quite good. <laughs> that That level of like... I'm the funny guy instead of a lot of players are very attached to their skill level, talent level, and accolades at the NBA level. He just completely did away with all that. Incredible. I didn't That's know what, that. Yeah, yeah. That makes the podcast he does like very, very funny and very, very worthwhile, I think. Um, Paul George, I think, does a really good uh, perspective on how players achieve things. And I think he does a really good, has a really good perspective on kind of like the machinations of the NBA. And I know you said most of them do well. I don't think they do. I think we hear about a few of them that do well, but a lot of players have podcasts. Like a lot, a lot, a lot. A lot of them have stopped podcasting because it wasn't worth their time necessarily. And it didn't mm. get the attention that they think it may be deserved. And I think it is because people... Being a player has a significant amount of interest because of your perspective, but you're not guaranteed to be able to vocalize that in an interesting way or in a compelling way. And you're not guaranteed to have carte blanche to tell all the stories that might make people interested in you. Mm -hmm. And part of that is related to like Gilbert Arenas versus JJ Redick. JJ Redick mostly is a guy who deep dives into basketball is kind of wondering about the machinations the perspective of the players, how they achieve things. Gilbert Arenas does that at times, but is does a lot of like salacious, you know, name calling, hot takey stuff, and is surrounded by a bunch of players who seem maybe more interested in providing that perspective of like he ain't shit type mm -hmm. of analysis, which is fundamentally not a lot different than like Stephen A. Smith or Skip Bayless or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And JJ Redick mostly is engaged in like 
analysis versus and then sometimes there's like a bit of tea or something on the podcast right and i'm not saying one is better than the other whatever you like is whatever you like but even the players have to diversify and become personalities and provide like a different level of entertainment or infotainment based on what the market wants and i think there's room for like one jj reddick there's room for a lot more of like Gills Arena type stuff because people do, on average, I think, kind of eat up the the more salacious stuff. So, and the more salacious stuff travels more quickly because of like clickbait and because of hot takes mm-hmm. and all that. So, but there are a lot of players. I think like, you know, CJ Miles. We know he did a podcast because he did it with Amit, you know, on Yahoo Sports. But it's still, as far as like viewership, not a big podcast. Chris Boucher's podcast, as far as like being understood or known in the wider canon of the NBA, like he and Mike doing the podcast together, it had an effect on Raptors, you know, Raptor fan consumption for some time, but the NBA wide, it didn't really penetrate. Um, Terrence Ross has been podcasting for forever. He has been like Twitch streaming for forever, I think, and no shade to Terrence, but probably his podcast, as far as like reach and impact, is probably less than like a, a Raptors Republic one at this point. And so it's not guaranteed success. And Trey Young's, I think, is popular. But honestly, I think it mimics kind of like other types of podcasts with a higher ceiling. But the amount of funding behind it is kind of what dictates if it, and marketing is kind of dictates how much space it has, you know, for people to listen and, and pay attention to it. And a lot of that is probably reliant on these players are interesting, but similar to a lot of other successful podcasts is like if you want to get it off the ground you have to have a really good editor and guys who cut clips and make edits and do all that kind of stuff who chop up the podcast into i don't know bite-sized stuff and then as i said like this is how we're hearing about these types of things but i don't think it's guaranteed success although i do think it is funny that there's like the white co-host guy who's just there <laughs> hilarious is that what you aspire to i'm joking obviously no. i i had a tweet actually where i was like and it, it i had the most odd response to the tweet because i don't think it was a unique thought i think a lot of people saw like the it was trey young's podcast where he it was like yet another white guy who's just like what are you doing here man like you're the white guy and then everybody was like okay i've seen like four podcasts now where an nba player is like I'm the NBA player. This is my small white friend. Where people, <laughs> people started thinking about it. So I made a joke about like, if any NBA players are looking for us. Small white where I was like, if any NBA players are looking for a small white, like podcaster guy, I can do that. And then there was another tweet that I think. You might Steph, be Trey like, Young's height. He's taller than me for sure. I think he's six two. Um, oh. But somebody else had tweeted the like a similar sentiment to me and i guess they found my tweet afterwards and they quote tweeted it and they just were like you know how there's like uh the chinese fighting fish is like if it sees itself it would like throw itself against the glass if you put a mirror and just like kill itself or it, if you put another fish in the tank with it it'll kill it he it quote not, tweeted me did not know that and he's like this guy should be ashamed please go make fun of him Trey he was young like, did no, 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 no. Just this random guy who had a popular tweet and he was like protecting his tweet. And then he was like, go make fun of this guy. And I was like, wait, what? Because we thought of the same joke. And I'm sure you're a comedian. You know, people, yeah. not every joke is stolen. Like not everything's novel. You, you yes. make some more jokes. And I was like, what the hell is going on here? But yeah, I made the joke because I think it's a good joke. Yeah. But yeah, I, a convoy of um, online people came after me. And good I was like, God, Whoa. it was incredible. And I, I said, like, I'm sorry I thought of the same joke as you, but worse. <laughs> I didn't oh, know. How to that's respond. a kind response. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I'm a kind Twitter response guy. You are? Yeah. I mean, Twitter, I mean, like, what are what are your feelings on Twitter now? Like, I mean, you're still the quite holistic active. feelings? Like you're quite active on it. Well, yeah, you have to market yourself, which mm-hmm. sucks. Mm-hmm. But yeah, like you have to say, I did work. Please look at my work. I worked so hard on this work. And you have to do that. Whereas like before, if you did our job, technically, the whatever the publication was would be like, there is work. Here's the work. Please Mm. look at the work. Mm. Um, 
I think that's mostly why I'm on Twitter. I was not an avid tweeter before I started doing this job. My thoughts on Twitter are that it is funny, at least for people in our industry who do like earnest things are like, hey, I did this thing that the first response is like someone being like my pussy in bio is like, it's so wait, funny. what? <laughs> what did you say? Have you never seen that under a tweet? There's like bots that say like, they just tweet under everything. They say my pussy in bio. You No. Seen that? It happens all the time, Catherine. <laughs> I guess you're. I guess you're not big on Twitter. Like you don't go on it. I'm not big much. on social media. Yeah. So you don't, uh, you don't go on it very much, but yeah, that's like all the time. Like the amount of bots that are like promoting, like, Oh, here's like this new gambling thing. Or it's like, I have pictures of my vagina. If you like to see it is like endless and they just show up and populate yeah. under every yes. tweet. The, the spam is crazy on that website, but I think there's a lot of funny tweets on the website. And I also need to be able to share my work with the world. So that's Twitter, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that you kind of laughed and blushed at the thought of the bots. Yeah. Well, they are funny. Mm -hmm. But it is a little disconcerting that, like, there's no longer a spam folder. You just, it's all the spam folder now. Yes. But you can't, like... <laughs> not that you would, but you can't be like, I don't, not interested, don't want to see no, this, and then no. get less of it. Well, it's under my own tweet. Oh, I can't, like, so people, your tweet. yeah, they they reply. Yikes! They want people to know. For those people who are interested in Emmanuel Quickly's progressions as a driver, hello, my pussy is also in the bio. <laughs> <laughs> We'll see, see this where, is why, where this does, is why where I love having Venn you on the show. Yeah. People don't get this in the in the post game wrap ups. You know what I mean? Like people don't get this. You you and you yeah you bring out the comedy in me. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I like to think so. Well, yeah, I'll let you know. Funny. I'll let you know if I ever get a, a bot reply like that, and that's when I'll know. Like I've the made next it. time you tweet, I'm going to tweet. <laughs> <laughs> Under when I promote this podcast, that'll yeah. probably be the next time I do. Yeah. You can post that underneath. That would um, be funny. Okay, brilliant. Uh, <laughs> we, should, we should move on. Uh, it's time for our Raptors Homer moment here. And my question for you, and I wrote, my God, what is salvageable for the rest of this season? Why is this team still fun to watch? Now, I know you're going to have a good answer for this because you've been tweeting all week that this team's been very satisfying to watch still. Yeah. Not as much last night. However, no, I do think the main three pillars of interest I have, Grady Dick probably above all else, mm -hmm. watching him develop some of his on-ball reps, watching him keep shooting it. He hasn't shot it well over the past three or four games, but them's the breaks. He's, you know, some of his finishing at the rim, which is aided by his profi his prolific cutting and proficient cutting, which is great. All of that is, like, super fun to watch. He's also, he's making better reads on defense. He's, like, doing some of the early work to beat guys to spots. All of that, to me, is very interesting to pay attention to. And probably more selfishly for me, as somebody who is paying attention to the minutia, it's good for my work because I will pay attention to the new show and deliver it to the people. And hopefully they like that. Fingers are crossed. Emmanuel quickly as like the main hub of an offense that is struggling where he doesn't have a ton of help. You get to see, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. We get to see his game pushed to the brink of what he's capable of and see what counters he comes up with. And any litany of, Whichever G League or G League adjacent guy you're interested in, Jonte, Javon Freeman Liberty, Jamias Ramsey, Jesus Carton, what, whatever it ends up being, Muhammad Ugi, if he comes up, all that kind of stuff, pick your guy, obsess over their minutes, and enjoy the little things, I think. And Jonte is giving like a ton of stuff to be excited about. Maybe not as like this guy's gonna change the you know the fortunes of the franchise, but it seems like the Raptors probably found an end of bench big who they can actually have on the roster for years who will be 
provide NBA impact, and they found him in the G League. That's what I think Jonte is, which is a great outcome for his career. Perhaps he achieves more, and we'll see what happens with that, but that's a win for the franchise. That's kind of what I'm paying attention to, I suppose. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I think um, Grady Dick's improvement has been you know, good to, and a relief, frankly, Dick, Dick is rising. Dick is rising. I was trying very hard to phrase that sentence without saying Dick is rising. <laughs> did, you, did you, that was, that was what I tweeted during the other game. I said, Dick showing. And, and it growth. went, it went, it traveled far. I saw, you, did you see the, did you see the tweet? And this is again, no wonder why you get so many spam bots. <laughs> <laughs> did you see the tweet that I tweeted and deleted afterwards? So I, I tweeted I Dick, Dick showing significant growth, and then I quote tweeted it, and I said, <laughs> "I said, hey, miss the start of the game. Uh, can anybody catch me up to what's been happening?" So the joke is, I wasn't tweeting about. Oh that. <laughs> no, I didn't. I did not see that. I, do, I, do, I saw I, the first one, but not the second one. It's so stupid. Uh, you do anyway. wish you were a comedian. Um, sometimes. I I could try to be a comedian if uh -huh. I wanted. Well, to. anyone. Could I don't try think I could. Yes, comedian. exactly. I don't think I could be a successful comedian, but I do enjoy a laugh. Certainly. Yeah. No, I feel I'm I feel sure. at home with you, Catherine. This Good. feels like like when I'm talking basketball, I just want to break free. Let me, <laughs> let me tell my stupid little jokes. <laughs> I don't fully believe that, but I appreciate the sentiment nonetheless. Yes. Yeah. Um, look, I guess we have a bit of a shorter podcast this week because we're already at our, our hottie highlight. Yeah. There wasn't. I'm sorry, fans. I just didn't have a lot to say about the Raptors this last week. I think there's like 14 minutes of basketball talk, 42 minutes in. So whoever the people yeah. who are listening, I think, have to be invested in um you know, comedy podcasts. I don't know if they listen to Tiger Belly or Andrew Santino or anything like that. And they see our repartee and they're like, these guys might have what it takes. That's one. <laughs> that's one person who's listening. Listen. Uh, the other person. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. Finish, please. Uh, the other person is like, I like Catherine and Samson. Whatever they say is fine and funny and I'll enjoy it along for the ride. And there's another person who is like, fuming that they've had to mine 14 minutes of basketball conversation out of 42 minutes of like <laughs> ticket sales uh xenophobia commentary and that was basketball related it's like adjacent to basketball it was basketball related for sure. i guess you know what i think about basketball is like specifically the on-court stuff so there's actually way more basketball conversation in this podcast than like but that's what this podcast is. And this is the void that we fill on Raptors. Republic. I love it. Listen, I appreciate everyone who listens to this I don't show. listen to sports podcasts. I no, listen but to I'm sports just saying podcasts. the people. I would listen to this one. The people say, who what listen does my to this girl show. girl Kathleen I, think? I, and why she's so funny? I want you to know that it truly does mean a lot to me. I mean, I know like, you know, I mean, I don't really... I should look up the numbers, but I don't. But I can see on YouTube that you know your stuff does significantly oh better. Oh my god! I had, Please, I did have no. a, I did have a negative comment once that was like basically saying like get this girl off the channel. She clearly has lower views than everyone else, and I was like, oh. Did you but tell them to go fuck themselves. No, because that would be giving him what he wants. You know what I mean? Like, mm. I, I, I think, uh, you know, I kind of had a moment where I was like, oh, like that one hurt a little. But then I was like, you know what? I'm going to I'm going to show up for the people who show up for me. Like, for yeah. real. You know what I mean? And then it is what it is. And then if it grows, it grows. And it's all good either way. You know, that is the that's the healthy perspective on this kind of stuff. It's like mm -hmm. everything is commodification to some degree. I get it. That's the world we live in. But if there are people who listen to you and like you and you serve a purpose in their day or their week or whatever, and you don't worry about numbers, and you know that there's some people out there, then it's, as long as you're okay with the time you spend putting into this, then I think that's super, super worthwhile. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I think so. I mean, I think, like, 
I could put more time into this in terms of like, you know, like you were saying earlier, like clipping it and stuff like that. Like I'm not even wow. on, I'm not even on TikTok, which Fuck is like them. crazy as a comedian as well. But I figured out a way to make a living doing this. Could, but... could we do like a, we should do a podcast with like, maybe we'll just do that during the summer. You, myself and Alan, we should do a podcast about like, yeah, trying to exist on social media as comedian slash sports like the intersection yes. alan shane lewis shout out yeah yeah because he has really interesting perspective on uh, social media i think as well and one that i agree with mm. and probably one that you agree with too so yeah i think so i love he's that. also I'm... so handsome and bald yeah handsome we could do a handsome bald man podcast you know you too could. And I. you could get in on that if you I like i could wear a bald cap yeah that would be so it. funny shows like solidarity. the hair. You could do the bald cap just on top, and then you could have like the Danny DeVito hair coming out of the back. I think <laughs> it might have to. I don't know if a bald cap could fit all of this. That'd be funny. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, that would be fun. I love doing like a summer podcast. I tried to do a Christmas special on this uh, podcast, and uh, I don't know. I got somebody being like, "This isn't about basketball enough," or "Why would I want to listen to this person?" It was it was all stars and sandwiches. We tried to pair different. We took a different all-star and paired them with a different sandwich. But I'll to never, me, it's like, that's what you do over the holidays. You have fun. I'll never understand, ever. I do not consume that way. Somebody who leaves a negative comment. I never. I, I'm not an avid commenter online. Mm -hmm. I do sometimes. But only to be, like, to shower praise. And I don't hate watch things. Mm -hmm. And I don't have this like selfish little idiot brain that thinks when I watch <laughs> something I don't like, everybody has to know, this is stupid. This isn't what I want. Okay. Stop then. Like, just go elsewhere. Do your thing. I'll never understand it. But I guess that's the world we live in. Bunch of stupid little people with like idiot brains. It is. It is. I mean, I forgot to turn on, I, as you were saying that, I'm like, I forgot to turn on my lamp. People have been, I got a compliment on my lighting, which shout out to you. I appreciated yeah. that. And then, and then I was like, it's just a lamp to the side. That's all, that's all it is. You have a whole, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't do the, <laughs> I don't do the. Wait, wait, wait. Yet. I'm like a, like Dune. Yes. Bring, bring spice production back to the level it needs. Push, <laughs> bravo. Push hard. <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. Oh, my God. I, I feel like a Dune character now, like a Harkonnen. This is this is classic ghost stories right here. Ooh, wait. Okay. For audio listeners, I'm manipulating time and space with my ring light. Yeah, time and space. Yeah. Not here, just we... lighting. No, it's all, we're bending reality. You do okay. kind of look like a villain right now. Did you watch Dune 2? No, I've seen the first one. Well, you need to watch the second one. I didn't Austin... like I didn't like the first one. Listen, I felt like they spent more time explaining those ugly sweatsuits and how they work. Oh my god, Samson. <laughs> Pretending to disconnect. Oh, they spent more oh, they spent more time two explaining minutes, two minutes talking about a still suit is too much for me. And you say you don't like TikTok? Look, like, can I finish? Can I finish? They they spent more time explaining how those sweatsuits work than the actual plot in any way, shape, or form. Not that plot should be explained. I was about to say plot need not be explained. Well, listen, I'm a screenwriter. That is actually how I think. Oh, you're a screenwriter? And, and, and you don't and like Dune, the movie that the saved cinema? The first Dune was not good. It was not good. Oh my God, Catherine, this is so regressive. I, I've better. heard you're better than this, quite frankly. I've heard the now, second one is better. I've heard the second one is better. Well, what you should be hearing is that the second one is like an achievement of cinematic proportion and helps validate um, a t intentional, intelligent, meaningful movie creation, first of all. Wow. And the first one is like that too. I, of course, read the Dune Saga. I am biased. <laughs> yes, of course. Yeah, I've but, not read um, the book, so I have no idea what's going on. Um, just 
Can, I do have I a basketball-related thing to say. About Shame on you. Him. I need to say that before we get out of here. For yeah, I didn't even game. say what the hottie highlight of the week is. But I yeah. do have a basketball-related thing to say about Dune, and then I'll do the hottie highlight of the week, okay. and then you can continue to shame me for not liking yes. the first Dune movie. Okay, so um, as people may know, there has been more increased talks again about a WNBA team in Toronto. Yes. So Larry Tenenbaum is doing an independent bid, uh, you know, separate from MLSE, towards getting a WNBA team. Very exciting. Um, I saw a post, I believe this was on Instagram about what the team should be named and multiple people said, well, since the Raptors were named after a popular movie of its day, Jurassic Park, how about naming the WNBA ah, name God, after, God. after something related to Dune and we're basically saying the worms. Multiple people suggested that the Shai WNBA Halud, team, the maker of the deep desert. I could, I could give a shit. I <laughs> listen. If, if the W, if the Toronto WNBA team becomes the Toronto Worms, I might murder. Like I might, I might actually murder. I might be at Young and Dundas Square screaming at the top of my lungs for several days. Like it would it would upset me so much. This is my this is a lifelong dream of mine to have a WNBA team in Toronto. They cannot be named after worms. I don't care. They can't be named after worms. No one wants to wear a jersey or a t-shirt with a goddamn worm on it. I Why don't care. They- so I don't know how well represented the worm clan is. Stop. I'm not sure, but I'm not actually, I wouldn't want it, them to be named the worms either. Like not remotely. I like think that's literally, really like idea. literally five or six comments were that. And oh. I had to, yeah. and I had to like stop myself. Like I, I, it was like, it was not just one person. That was the introduction Will gave me on the show. He referred to me as the worm rider. Because oh <laughs> because I'm a huge fan of Dune. And even it's that, fine. it just it didn't no, no, it's not fine. It was we played it for comedic effect, but there's no way like dinosaurs are cool before Jurassic Park. Dune is cool yeah. not because of the sandworms. The sandworms are like a very interesting wrinkle in Dune and are you know very closely tied to the ecology of the planet. The spice must flow, as it were. Mm. And they, <laughs> nobody like worms are up against it they're only cool within the context of dune and you're like wow shy halud this is like awesome but as far as like outside of it everyone's like if you want to insult somebody you call them a worm mm-hmm. whereas like you wouldn't be like t-rex raptor you wouldn't do that so i don't think it has the same juice i think they'll be called probably the raptor ets maybe wow <laughs> Samson's really, really trying to start his career in comedy today. It's not going well. It's not um, going well. I feel fine about it, to be quite frank. Um... <laughs> All right, we thank you for killing time with me. This is this has gone very off the rails, and and you know what? I don't mind. I don't mind because you are the face of Raptors oh. Republic. Speaking of faces of the league, you're the face of Raptors Republic, so I won't get in trouble. Do you um, think people wait as part of the league, the Raptors Republic League? Do you find it disconcerting that the face is a bald man? Are we looking for like different types of representation here? Uh, I think Raptors Republic's pretty diverse. Even Lewis is bald. Is this maybe too much bald? I don't think it's too much bald. Okay. I mean, look, if Blake, if Blake Murphy was bald. Then it's like, well, now it's generational. You know what I mean? That's true, yeah. But Will and Blake, Will especially, Will is like a hairline king. Yes. Vivek is a hairline king. Yes. Blake is not a hairline king, but he's like has hair. Yeah. There's one thing. S S has hair. He's lost some I'm, of it, but I'm it, not commenting. But there's a good amount of hair there. I'm not commenting. No I'm complimenting comments. S. You can compliment him. That's fine. 
whatever you two are like besties um all right the hottie highlight of the week this week is going to kelly olenic for oh. being the first raptor to get a flopping violation congratulations <laughs> kelly olenic finally breaking that barrier do you think they should let him wear a snapback on the court uh no i think, I think it would fly off no 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 he hoops with it he got married in a snapback i i i only saw that recently raptors Probably fans are crazy we're bet i bet we're the only fan base that ever cared for all the teams he's played on no there's no way the nba the nba like fandom at large was this is snapback poppy like this is who he is snapback poppy yeah is That's that uh is that a handle because he should he should take it probably already was taken to be honest snapback with you. poppy he could pay like 400 dollars. you should take it. it i wear zero snapbacks but does that matter nothing's wear, real nothing's real anymore samson i wear fitted caps oh i don't i don't wear any they don't really fit my hair nicely you do have big hair it's I hard to make a hair. hat fit big hair yeah yeah i don't have that problem good for you thanks uh all right baldy <laughs> let's let's wrap it up there <laughs> um i uh i would tell i always end the podcast by uh saying like let us know what you're up to and where people can find you on the internets but everyone who listens to this show knows can you uh, where they can in, find you can you put in the bio like the google url of just like my name the google url like the your... search like if you type in samson folk in the search results you just like copy that link and put it there yeah i'll do the image results How about... <laughs> <laughs> i'll do the image results and maybe i'll do the google maps results and then see if that actually <laughs> tells us where you live <laughs> oh my god that would be scary yeah that'd be um, insane could you imagine? Uh, it's like the phone book. You used to be able to look up somebody's name. Well, I'm sure you still can. I don't know how active phone books are, they like it, how important they are to the fabric of society anymore. But if you could just type someone's name into Google and be like, this is where they are. Insanity. Yeah. Maybe maybe short people are still using them on chairs. Probably not. That's That was I was watching like a Conan skit two years ago. Very fresh in my brain. <laughs> but he was doing like a tinder he was doing like a tinder sketch mm -hmm. and he kept saying like why don't they have more information here like where their home is so i can go to them and make them like me and I, was like, oh, that's so funny. <laughs> I love conan i think he's one of the funniest he, he is he is the like by such a wide margin the best late night host yeah like, i ever, agree ever i agree he, He's a genius. His podcast is amazing. I that's one of the f very few podcasts I listen to. Yeah. Uh yeah. listen to have you listened to the Arnold Schwarzenegger episode? I haven't. No. That's worth that's really worthwhile. Mm. Definitely uh does go he back do an Arnold impression? I Arnold? think he does. I think he does. Very good. I, and Arnold is like roasting Conan for like that's, a lot of it. It's incredible. I always really loved martin shorts dynamic with conan you know like he walks into yes. the room and conan was wearing shorts and he says like well you're coming from summer camp then and like conan was like holy <laughs> he also did um he did like one of conan's last interviews and he had the best introduction of any i've ever seen someone introduce it. he walks in he's very like you know how martin short is he's very like gracious or whatever he says my goodness conan I haven't seen you since the January 6 riots. And I was like, wow. <laughs> what an entrance. Very good. He's magnanimous, I think. Yes, that's a good word. That's a good yeah. word for them. Um, listen, everybody, thank you again for listening to the show. I appreciate you a lot. I don't know why this went off the rails so much. I don't know why we had such non-basketball related talk. We're mid-season. You, you would think this was an episode in August. But uh, mm -hmm. here we are, uh, middle of March. I guess it's because you sort of know the Raptor season isn't, you know, we're not playing for, for much at this point. But we're going to keep it going as we do. Um, thank you again. Thank you, Samson, for joining me this week. And uh, hope your comedy career after today is thriving. Um, did you think of anything else that you've emotionally spent money on? No. Okay. 
Well, that was uh, in the biz. We call that a callback. Yeah. And you didn't yes and the question. So comedy career, you know. Well, I'm not necessarily an improv. I like to make it work from what I'm seeing on the page on the okay. script. And that's so out you're, of a, so you're just pretentious. A, no, no, no. That's out <laughs> of a deep pretentious. No, no, that's out of a deep reverence for the screenwriter, such as yourself. And to to think yeah. to have the type of like ego to think I could come in and off the cuff do something better. I just I I don't agree with it all. Wow. Well, all right. Well, I hope we uh, see more ghost stories on your many pods. Um, I don't even know the Dune character that you are emulating right now. Um, listen, I'm gonna. I'll watch Dune too at some point. I'll let you know Please. what I think. Yeah. Uh, and I'll maybe maybe I'll do a video like this. Actually, I don't have a ring light, so maybe I won't. Whatever, whatever you want to do. Whatever I want to do. Whatever you want to do. Listen, next week, I'm sure we'll be more basketball focused, but I hope you enjoyed this off the rails podcast. Nonetheless, uh, thank you again. And we'll catch you next time. Bye. Bye.